Welcome to the Institute of Catholic Culture, a nonprofit Catholic organization dedicated to the re-evangelization of our society through educational and cultural programs offered to the public at no charge. This and other presentations, hundreds of hours of audio, are available for free on our website, www.instituteofcatholicculture.org. There you can listen to or download educational programs related to all aspects of our divine faith, and you can review our schedule of upcoming events. We hope you can join us in person. Through the prayers of our Holy Fathers, Lord Jesus Christ, our God, have mercy on us and save us. Amen. Blessed are you, O Christ our God, who have filled the fishermen with wisdom by sending down the Holy Spirit upon them. And who through them have caught in your net the whole world, O lover of mankind, glory to you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay. You like that? That was our um, our pilgrimage anthem when we went to the Holy Land, and uh, we must have sang that like I don't know a couple hundred times, right? That was that was great. We had a lot of fun around the Sea of Galilee with that. Now, looking at your map, I want to read you a quotation from Eusebius. Look at your map and the lines you just drew. Eusebius, writing in around, he died around 340 A.D. He says, "Thus, under the influence of heavenly." power and with divine cooperation the doctrine of the Savior like the rays of the sun. Look at your map from Jerusalem. The doctrine of the Savior like the rays of the sun quickly illumined the whole world and straight away in accordance with the divine scriptures the voice of the apostles went forth through all the earth. In every city and village, churches were established, filled with multitudes of people. And those whose minds were fettered by the ancient disease of idolatrous superstition found a release from the most cruel bondage. Who knows? But trust me, the apostles had a lot more distractions. <laughs> Pay attention. Found, they found release from the most cruel bondage. They renounced with abhorrence every demonic form of polytheism and confessed that there was only one God, the creator of all things, and him they honored with rites of true piety. Isn't that beautiful? Like rays of the sun going out. Okay, we looked at St. James the Greater last week, and I'll just finish our thoughts and as a bridge to this week with a quote again from Eusebius. He says, concerning this James, James the Greater, Clement of Alexandria relates a story which is worthy of mention. Remember, don't worry about that noise. Remember, James comes back to Jerusalem and he's martyred, okay, by the sword. Clement of Alexandria, or Eusebius, quoting Clement, says that, um, he says uh, there's a, a story which, which is worth mentioning, telling it as he received it from those who had lived before him. So even pre Previous to Clement, the story was around. He says that the one who had led James to the judgment seat, who had, who had, who had turned him in, okay, when he saw James bearing his testimony, he was so moved that he confessed that he himself also was a Christian. They both then were taken and led away together. And on the way, this man begged James he begged James to forgive him. And he, after considering a little, said, peace be with you. James said, peace be with you and kissed him. And thus they were both beheaded at the same time. And then, as the divine scriptures say, that Herod, upon the death of James, seeing the, de the deed pleased the Jews, attacked Peter also and committed him to prison. Okay, so he was beheaded with the guy who had turned him in. 
our next two apostles that we want to talk about are the apostle Simon and the apostle Jude. The apostle Simon and the apostle Jude. For our sake, I think it might be helpful for us very quickly to uh, to write down the names of the apostles from memory. I've got a little cheat sheet here, just in case I get confused. But go ahead, tell me, who are we going to list first? Peter and Andrew, his brother, right? Let's, let's, let's do them as family members, yeah? Peter and Andrew and James and John. Those guys are easy, okay? Who, who next? Who else would you like that? How about let's put in there Simon and Jude, since we're going to deal with them next. Simon and Jude, traditionally understood, and we'll look at why, brothers, okay, brothers, and the tradition tells us they were sons of, sons of, no, Joseph, okay, and James and John were sons of Zebedee, right, and Peter and Andrew were sons of, of Jonah, okay, sons of Jonah. There are two other brothers that we know of that are sons of Alphaeus or Cleopas, which we're going to look at later. Do you remember who they are? Sons of Alphaeus, James the Lesser, and, and Matthew. Some of you are cheating from last week's notes. Matthew and Matthew's other name is? Levi. Levi. It's not uncommon to have two names or even three names. Okay? So Matthew, Levi, this is James the Less, and this is James the Greater. Okay? And then two friends. Two friends. Philip. Philip. Good. And yeah, and Bartholomew. Ba and what do we know about Bartholomew? What's his other name? Nathaniel, which is probably his first name, Nathaniel, something like that, okay? Bar, which means son of, right? Son Tholome. Okay. All right. And then two final apostles, Thomas and Matthias. Matthias replaced Judas Iscariot, right? So now you know him. And I encourage you, when you're going around this week, do that by memory in the car. Turn off the radios and things like that. Do it by memory so you get them stuck in your head, okay? Fine. Simon, turn to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. <clears throat> Something very interesting about Simon, and that is his identity. Who is this guy? What's he known as? Simon the... <laughs> The Zealot, Simon the Zealot. And we're going to look at why he's called Simon the Zealot. Ch uh, Matthew chapter 10, verse, uh, well, verse 2 through 4 gives us the list of, um, of apostles. But notice it's in verse 4 that Simon is mentioned. Simon the, what does it say in your Bibles? The Canaanian, right? The Canaanian, which means what? He's from what town? Cana in Galilee, right? Well, some have said that he is from Cana and Galilee. However, there's a good reason to believe that this does not mean that he's from Cana and Galilee at all. And we're going to look at the reason why. Turn your Bibles over to the Gospel of Luke. Mark says the same thing, by the way. He calls him the Canaanian. Take a look at Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6, verse uh, well, it starts with at 13, but we're going to pick him up in verse 15. Okay, halfway through the list. See that verse, uh, verse 15? And Matthew and Thomas and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, who is called the Zealot. The zealot. The zealot. So we have him mentioned in two different places with two different names, the Canaanian and the Zealot. Why is that? First of all, who were the zealots? I think you guys will probably figure it out. They're probably guys like me, right? Yeah. That are, okay. So, uh, the zealot. Who were the zealots? They were actually a, a political party among the Jews. And many have said, well, that he must have been a member of this political party before he joined the apostles. But I'll share this with you from Josephus, writing in the late first century, uh, a Jewish historian. He says that, that the zealots were men who 
agreed in all things with the Pharisaic notions. They were Pharisees, basically. Okay, But they had an inviolable attachment to liberty and say that God is to be their only ruler and Lord. They also do, do not value dying of any kind of death. Nor indeed do they heed the deaths of their relations or friends. So like when the other guys die, they just, it, doesn't, it doesn't bother them. They just keep going. Okay, they're really hardcore. Nor can any such fear make them call any man his Lord. And it was in the time of Jesus Florus that the nation began to grow mad with distemper. He was the procurator from, about, from 64 to 66 BC, uh, uh, AD, I'm sorry. And who occasioned, he occasioned the Jews to go wild by abuse of his authority and to make them revolt from the Romans. It was these guys who Josephus is saying began to become just infuriated with the control of the Romans. And they went into revolt. 64 to 66, they start, he says the Jew, the nation just started going mad with this movement called zealotry. And it ends up leading to what? The fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Okay. But notice he says it wasn't until si the time of 64 to 60. This is the time when the zealot and zealots really formed as a party among the Jews. So we've got a problem because zealotry as a, as a movement, as a political movement, wasn't around at the time of Christ. So what do we mean by Simon the zealot? So what do we know? What do we know? The word for zealot, the word for zealot in Hebrew is kanai. Kanai. What did we hear in Gospel of Matthew? Simon the Cananean. The Cananean. And in the Gospel of Luke, Simon the zealot, otherwise known as the Cananean. Simon the Zealot. Now, we got to take it one step further. If the Zealot party as a movement wasn't around at the time of Christ, then what can we say about Simon as one who is zealous? I think oftentimes reading jo Josephus and knowing a little bit about Jewish history, we, we, we make the Zealots out to be, as he describes it, like madmen. They, they refused obedience, right? But really, what does the word zealous mean? If we're going to describe one of the apostles as zealous, how about ardent maybe is a little better word in the English that comes to us, huh? Simon, the one who is zealous, who is ardent. About what? We're not talking about revolting against the Romans anymore, are we? What was Simon zealous? What was he ardent about? Right. Exactly. Simon was known among his brothers as the most faithful, as the most ardent, as the most zealous follower and disciple of Christ. In fact, the, the, one of the dictionaries I was looking up says this exactly. It says the term zealot in Hebrew, kanai, or more frequently in the plural, kanaim, that im is always the plural, right? Seraph, seraphim, uh, cherub, cherubim is the plural in the Hebrew, okay? Kananim means one who is zealous on behalf of God. The term derives from the Greek, so it actually, it's a borrowed word from the Greek into the Hebrew, okay? And from the Greek, it has maybe a little bit more of the, the, tent, the sense that we're looking at, which is an emulator, who is a zealous admirer or a follower. Simon was faithful. We know something more about him in the Gospel of Mark chapter 6, verse 3. You know, Jesus is teaching on the Sabbath and so forth. And then um, they're asking, where did this man get all of this? And in verse three, it picks up the story. Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary? And are his brothers are James and Josie's and Judas, Jude. OK. And Simon, 
So we know he is the brother of James, Josie's, who we don't know anything about. And what, which James is this, by the way? Is this James the Greater that we talked about last week? No. No. James the Lesser? Just. Ah, there is, now I will tell you that there is, uh, there is some people that say that James the, the, uh, the lesser, where is he here? That James the lesser is James the just. But there's another tradition, which I think is a little bit more uh, ancient in its, in its uh, what do you want to call it? The fathers, the fathers held it more, more among themselves that this James was another James called James the just or James the righteous or James the brother of God. Okay. So he's the brother of Jude who we're going to look at and the brother of James the just or the righteous who the tradition tells us became the bishop, the first bishop of Jerusalem. Okay. He became the first bishop of Jerusalem. He's also, according to this text, the brother of Jude, uh, Jude, yeah, but the brother of? Simon. Yeah, and the brother of the most important guy, Jesus. Jesus. Right, and I told you last week that there is one portion of the tradition that says that Joseph was an old man when he was betrothed to Mary, and there was the reason why he was given to her to protect her as an old man, that he had been a widower, and that these were his sons, Simon and Jude. Okay, among other sons. All right. As I said, that it is believed that the James mentioned here in Mark is not James the Greater or James the Less, but James the Just, not one of the twelve. Eusebius tells us this. There was James who was known as the brother of the Lord, for he too was called Joseph's son. And Joseph was called Christ's father, though in fact the virgin was his betrothed. And before they came together, she was found to be with child of the Holy Spirit, as the inspired gospel narrative tells us. This James, whom the early Christians surnamed the righteous because of his outstanding virtue was the first, as the record tells us, to be elected to the Episcopal throne of Jerusalem after James was martyred. And there's a whole story that I gave you last week I sent you home with, that the, the, the James was taken up to the top of the temple and the, the Jews told him to deny Christ in front of everybody and instead he professed Christ. They threw him off the temple and when he didn't die, they beat him with clubs. Okay, until he died. He says, after the martyrdom of James, there's a firm tradition that those of the apostles and disciples of the Lord who were still alive assembled from all parts together with those who, humanly speaking, were kinsmen of the Lord. James, well, we know James, who is now dead, the martyr James from here, right? Simon, Jude, and Josias. For most of them were still living, Eusebius says. Then they all discussed together whom they should choose as a fit person to succeed James, the brother of the Lord, and voted unanimously that Simon was to be elected to the throne. Now, who is Simon in relation to James the Just? It's his brother. Okay, so very fitting that his brother is then raised up to the throne of Jerusalem. Now, if you're getting a little bit confused with all these James and peoples, don't worry. It is confusing, but we're going to keep working through it together. Okay? After serving the church in Jerusalem, as many of the apostles did after, after fulfilling their first assignment, they left their original location. So the tradition is that, 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 uh, that Simon left Jerusalem and Dorotheos, Bishop of Tyre, who died in the 300, claims that he preached first in Africa and eventually uh, he made his way to Britain. So he must have come out of Jerusalem and then worked his way maybe through Egypt, Africa, and over eventually to Britain. Okay, Some believe that he died in Britain, but certainly the tradition is that by 44 A.D., Simon had made his way to Britain. And this is very interesting because in 43 AD, the year before, Britain became part of the Roman Empire. So one year before, all of a sudden, the highways of the Roman Empire are open up. And the first ones to go down that highway are the apostles. 
The Coptic tradition is that, that, he, that Simon did indeed travel through Egypt, through North Africa, to Britain, but that he did not die in Britain. That after evangelizing in Britain, it is believed there was an uprising, a revolt against the Romans, and also a revolt against anyone who was not of the people of the land. That he was driven out. He was driven out. He returned to the east and eventually made his way uh, to Armenia. To Armenia. St. Nicephorus, Bishop of Constantinople in the 8th century, believed that Simon eventually left Britain due to that violent uprising, and probably in reaction to the domination of the Roman Empire, and the tradition claims that he then joined his brother Jude and the Apostle John in the area of Armenia, which was up on your map. You should find it now. Armenia is between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. It's that little land bridge, right? It's that little land bridge there. Okay, we're going to then set Simon aside. Simon is up in, the, in, the, in that land bridge called Armenia. And then we're going to pick up the story of his brother Jude, who's going to meet him then in Armenia and be martyred together with him. Okay. It is believed that Jude, the apostle Jude, was the first apostle to leave Jerusalem after Pentecost. And so I want to make sure that we get him up here towards the beginning of our list of apostles. Uh, you, can, you can see his story, in, or him listed in the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, in those list of apostles, that he is listed as... Jude and as Thaddeus. Okay, again, a guy with two different names. Jude means what? What what name does it come from, guys? What do you think? From the tribe of Judah, exactly. And, And of course, Joseph, being of the line of David, was from what tribe? Judah, Judah exactly. Uh, there's different translations of the, of the uh, attempts to translate the name Thaddeus, but the one I thought was most fitting is courageous. Courageous. Why courageous? Because his brother is called zealot or ardent, right? The ardent one. So we have a courageous one and the ardent one, two brothers. It makes a lot of sense. Um, you see in Mark, uh, sorry, in Matthew chapter 10 that he is called Thaddeus. You don't have to turn there. And also in Mark. But I want you to turn to the gospel of Luke. Turn with me to Luke because we find something very interesting in Luke that tells us maybe a little bit more about uh, this family. A little bit more about Jude himself, but also more about this family uh, that, that, that some have said are sons of Joseph. Take a look at Luke chapter 6. Luke 6, 13. Okay, and when it was, was day, he called his disciples and chose from them twelve, whom he named apostles, Simon, whom he named Peter, and Andrew, his brother, and James, and John, and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James, the son of Alphaeus, that's James the Lesser, right? And Simon, who is called the, the Zealot, and Judas, or Jude, the son of James. Now you say, Deacon Sabatino, I thought you said that there's a tradition that calls him the son of Joseph. Well, it turns out that you're, the editors of your Bible take a little leeway here. The Greek text, and I went back, I looked at the Greek, the Greek text does not say son of James. Okay? The Greek text says Jude of James. Now, most of us would take that as son of James, and that's exactly what the editors and translators of your Bible did. However, that does not fit with the tradition of who this man is. Simply says Jude of James. Many of the fathers identified this Jude as none other than the Jude that wrote the epistle, which is in your Bible. Now turn with me very quickly to that epistle of Jude. By the way, while you're looking that up, the gospel of John simply identifies Jude as Jude, not Iscariot. Jude, not the other guy. Okay. Okay, what do we know about Jude from this epistle? Look at verse 1. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ 
and brother of James, of James, brother of James. Not son of James, but brother of James. And why in the world would he be identified simply as of James? And why would he identify himself as servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James rather than, I mean, look, if I was the brother of Jesus, I think I would have identified myself in that way. Okay, but he doesn't do so. Why? There is a tradition I'll share with you. St. Theophilactus, who was Bishop of Nicomedia in the 8th century, says, of course, quoting the Gospel of John, do you remember... The Gospel of John tells us that even his brethren did not believe in him. His brethren did not believe in him. You can write that down if you want in John chapter 14. We won't turn there right now for lack of time, but chapter 14, verse 22 and John 7, verse 5. In fact, it's there that in John chapter 14 that the apostles say, his brothers say, how will you manifest yourself to us and not to the world? His brothers want him to go out and proclaim himself to be what he's claiming to be and destroy the Romans. But John tells us that even his brothers did not believe in him. Okay, so we've got a problem even among our apostles, which we already know that there's been problems among the apostles, even with Peter. Okay, St. Theophilactus, Bishop of Nicomedia, says, Even his brethren, the children of Joseph, of whom was this Jude, did not believe in him, that is Jesus. And whence came this disbelief? From their foolish will and from envy. From envy. You can imagine brothers becoming envious of their brother. Okay? The tradition also continues that when Joseph returned with the Holy Family from Egypt, that he began to divide his property, his land that he owned, among his children, one of which was Jude. And he wanted to give a portion to Jesus, but that the other brothers went up in arms because they did not share a mother in common. Uh, but only James, the tradition says, only James the righteous stood up for Christ. He split his own portion in half and gave half of it to his brother Jesus. The others then, realizing their sin, though they remain part of the close network and friends of Jesus, Jude himself, in an act of humility most likely, identifies himself in Jude as servant of Jesus. And he's identified in the list of the apostles simply as of James. He identifies himself with James. Why? Because James is the only one of his brothers who treated the Lord righteously. And he receives his reward for it. Little is known of him after Pentecost. But we do know a few things. There is a tradition that his wife's name was Miriam. Okay, another Mary, if things weren't confusing enough with all the Marys. St. Nicephorus, St. Nicephorus, who I quoted earlier, says the divine Jude preached the gospel and disseminated Christianity first in Judea, Galilee, Samaria, Idumea, and afterwards in Arabia, Syria, and Mesopotamia. Finally, he came to the city of Edessa. I was trying to point that out to you last week. It's right up in this area. It's the city of Edessa, just north of Antioch on the way to Armenia. He came to the city of Edessa, which belonged to a certain king, Abgarus. And you have in your handout tonight um, the story of what took place. I want you guys to get a sense of these traditional texts that have come down to us because men like Eusebius, Eusebius was a church historian and not everything he wrote proved to be accurate, but he certainly was interested in accuracy. And he tells this story that he himself went to Edessa and consulted the, uh, the files there. 
that they had about this king. And this is the story he tells that he received in the fourth century. He says, the king Abgris, who ruled with great glory, the nation beyond the Euphrates, being afflicted with a terrible disease, which it was beyond the power of human skill to cure. When he heard of the name of Jesus and of his miracles, which were attested by all with one accord, sent a message to Jesus by a courier and begged him to heal his disease. But Jesus did not at that time comply with his request. Yet he deemed him worthy of a personal letter. At least Eusebius believes that Christ actually responded to this king. He deemed him worthy of a personal letter in which he said that he would send one of his disciples to cure his disease and at the same time promise salvation to himself and all his house. Not long afterwards, his promise was fulfilled. For after his resurrection from the dead and his ascent into heaven, Jesus, by divine impulse, sent Thaddeus. He uh, who was also numbered among the 70 disciples of Christ. So it's believed that he was before that one of the 70. Okay. And then became part of the 12 as a preacher and evangelist of the teaching of Christ. Thaddeus began then in the power of God to heal every disease and infirmity insomuch that all wondered. And when Abgris heard of the great wonderful things which he did and of the cures which he performed, he began to suspect that he was the one of whom Jesus had written him, saying, after I have been taken up, I will send you one of my disciples who will heal you. Therefore, Abgris summoned Thaddeus and asked Thaddeus if he were in truth a disciple of Jesus, the son of God. And Thaddeus said, because you have mightily believed in him that sent me, therefore have I been sent unto you. And still further, if you believe in him, the petition of your heart shall be granted you as you believe. And Abgris said to him, I too have believed in him and in his father. And Thaddeus said to him, therefore, I place my hand upon you in his name. And when he had done it immediately, Abgris was cured of the disease and of the suffering which he had. And Abgris marveled that as he had heard concerning Jesus, so he had received in very deed through his disciple Thaddeus, who healed him without medicines and herbs, and not only him, but also many other inhabitants of the city and did wonders and marvelous works and preached the works of God. And afterward, Abgris said, you, O Thaddeus, do these things with the power of God. And we marvel. But in addition to these things, I pray you to inform me in regard to the coming of Jesus, how he was born in regard to his power, by what power he performed these deeds of which I have heard. And Thaddeus said, tomorrow assemble for me all the citizens and I will preach in their presence and sow among them the word of God concerning the coming of Jesus, how he was born and concerning his mission for what purpose he was sent by the father and concerning the power of his works and the mysteries which he proclaimed in the world and by what power he did these things and concerning his new preaching and his abasement and humiliation how he humbled himself and died and debased his divinity and was crucified and descended even into Hades and burst the bars which from eternity had not been broken and he raised the dead for he descended alone but rose with many and thus ascended to his father. And Abgris therefore commanded the citizens to assemble early in the morning to hear the preaching of Thaddeus. And afterward, he ordered the gold and silver to be given to him. But he refused to take it, saying, if we have forsaken that which was our own, how shall we take that which is another's? These things were done in the 340th year. From Edessa, it is believed that Jude traveled to Armenia. And the Armenian church claims Jude as its founder. From Armenia, they traveled into Persia and even into Iran. And it was in Persia that the two brothers confronted two pagan priests who began to cause trouble. The two priests had been driven out of Ethiopia by the preaching of Matthew the Apostle. But even against these two priests, it is said that the two brothers, Simon and Jude, converted 60,000 people in the city of Babylon, the ancient city of Babylon alone. Around the year 79 AD, the two pagan priests drummed up a mob who attacked the apostles Simon and Jude. And as the tradition relates, when they were captured by the mob, Jude turned to Simon and said, quote, I see that the Lord is calling us. 
the crowd hearing the words of the apostles began hurling stones at them. And after seeing that they could not kill them with stones, the mob crucified St. Jude. And finally, a man rushed forward and struck him with a spear through his heart. Simon joined his brother in martyrdom when he was seized. His body stretched out and the captures sawed his body into pieces. Tertullian said that the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. And even today, the percentage of Armenians is close to 100% Christian. 97% of Armenians are faithful followers of Christ. The next two apostles, St. Philip and, uh, and Bartholomew, also known as Nathaniel, right? Nathaniel and Philip, both actually Bartholomew. Or Bartholomew. Um, what do we know about Philip? What do we know about the Apostle Philip? Open your Bibles to the Gospel of John chapter 1. I don't even have to have you read the text because we know that Philip was a disciple of John the Baptist. In the Gospel of John chapter 1, verse 35 and following, and in verse 43, it says, The next day Jesus decided to go to Galilee, and he found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now Philip was was from Bethsaida. Now, where's Bethsaida? Bethsaida is just north on the north tip of the Sea of Galilee, right near where the Jordan River comes into the Sea of Galilee. Okay, so most likely a fisherman. It was a fishing village. Um, now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Interesting. Do you think he knew Andrew and Peter? Yeah. Guarantee you he knew. Bethsaida was not a big city. Okay, absolutely he knew them. Philip found... Nathaniel. So he goes off and runs and finds his friend Nathaniel. And you know about Nathaniel. Nathaniel confesses, Jesus finds, he says, before I saw you under the fig tree, I, I knew you, right? He calls him out by name. And Nathaniel confesses him to be the Christ. But regardless, we know something about Philip, don't we? First of all, he's got a friend. His friend's Nathaniel. Okay? But second of all, what else do we know? He's from Bethsaida. He's probably a fisherman. What else do we know about him. Come on, what kind of person finds the Messiah and leaves? He was evangelical. You want a, you want a, a saint to pray to to get the, the, the confidence to go and share the good news of Jesus Christ? Here's your man. He was evangelical. But the other thing we know about him is he's fully committed to Christ. Because when you confess Jesus to be the Christ, what are you confessing him to be? Don't just translate the word into Hebrew for me. What does it mean to be the Christ? It means to literally be the anointed one. And what kind of person is anointed among the Jews? The king. He confessed him to be the king, the Messiah, the king who was to come. My friends, this is treason. This is what you get crucified for. He committed treason in this act. He was fully committed and convinced of who Jesus was. And he didn't care about his own life for that. In John chapter 6, he was there at the multiplication of the loaves and fishes. It was Philip who says, who Jesus calls Philip over. You remember the story and says, Philip, we got a bunch of people here. What are we going to do to feed them? You know, Jesus knew, but he was putting Philip to the test a little bit. What Philip says, 200 denarii could not feed all of these people. We have absolutely nothing. How are we going to feed them? And who steps up right then? Do you remember? The apostle Andrew steps up. So Philip and Andrew are kind of, maybe you could say they were right near each other. They were right near each other. You say, big deal, Deacon Sabatino. Well, it's a big deal because guess what? Later on in the Gospel of John in Acts chapter 12 at Passover, just before the passion of the Lord. In fact, Lazarus has already been raised from the dead. The Palm Sunday procession, when Christ comes into Jerusalem, Jerusalem. They're waving the palms. Just had taken place. And it says some Greeks who came to the feast of Passover that year came to find Christ. And they came to Philip. And Philip, John says, 
went to Andrew. So what do we know about Philip and Andrew? They're buddies. They're buddies and they respect each other. Okay. So we have friendships. We have relationships among the apostles, close friends, Nathaniel and Philip, Andrew, who's the brother of Peter. Why would Andrew and Philip be friends? Where are they from? That's say that exactly. They were buddies. They were fishing buddies together. Okay. Isn't that beautiful? These were real people, guys. They're not just pictures and statues on our walls. These were real people. Philip is also the one that says in John 14, Lord, show us the father. And Jesus says, he who has seen me has seen the father. So Philip was still growing in his understanding of who Christ was. Many of the fathers, including St. Polycarp and St. Irenaeus, say that Philip the apostle is the same Philip that we meet in Acts of the Apostles in chapter 8. And you'll remember, who does Philip in chapter 8 end up confronting or meeting? He meets two people. First, Simon the Magician, right, who tries to buy the Holy Spirit. You remember that? Simon the Magician, but he also meets the Ethiopian eunuch, right? And he runs up to the Ethiopian eunuch. The Ethiopian's doing a Bible study in his carriage, right? And he runs up. He says, do you understand what you're talking, what you're you're reading? He says, how can I unless somebody helps me? Have you ever felt like that when you're reading the Bible? (laughs) Absolutely. You need help. You need help. And guess what? Other people need help from you too. So here's another great icon, an image and saint, a patron saint of evangelization. It is believed that Philip left Jerusalem uh, and ended up, as he went up into Galilee, it was in Galilee that he met the Ethiopian eunuch. And from there, headed up north into Syria, Um, and eventually into Asia Minor. So he just headed up right here past Antioch and into this realm here. Okay. While he was going through Galilee, there's a tradition that he raised a little boy. He came across a mother who was weeping. She was distraught, holding her dead boy in her arms. He came up to the woman and said to the boy, Arise, doth Christ command thee, for it is him that I preach. And at that moment, the little boy opened his eyes and walked. From Galilee, he traveled into Greece, where he healed the blind. There's no number of stories of St. Philip healing the blind. So my dear friends, if you suffer from a lack of sight, you struggle with your eyes, his relic is right over there. Okay. Don't leave here with going and touching that relic to your eyes and ask God if it is his will to heal you. It can happen. Eventually, he traveled to the ancient city of Lydia and Mysia, where he joined his old friend, Nathaniel or Bartholomew. Philip's sister, Miriam, was also with him. And Philip's four daughters. Philip's wife had died, and so he was, he was a widower. In one of the towns, he joined John the Apostle. And finally, he made his way to uh, Hierapolis and Phrygia. Eusebius says that in Asia, great luminaries sleep who shall rise again on the last day. The day of the Lord's advent, when he is coming with glory from heaven and shall search out all his saints, such as Philip, one of the twelve who sleeps in Hierapolis. Okay, so he's buried there in Asia Minor. The tradition tells us that it was in Hierapolis that Philip and Bartholomew healed many who were sick and even gave sight to the blind, but that Philip's martyrdom came in this way. The wife of the mayor of the city had been bitten by a snake. The man, the mayor of the city, was out. She heard that Philip was healing people in the city and called for Philip the Apostle to come to her. He did come to her and he did heal her and she asked for baptism. But when her husband came home and learned that his wife had become a Christian, he became enraged 
and he ordered the apostles and Miriam, Philip's sister, to be arrested. You have in your handout the, from the Acts of Philip, a fourth century text which comes down to us, which tells just a little bit of his story. Acts of Philip. When the tyrant saw them, he gnashed his teeth, his teeth again, we saw the apostles, he gnashed his teeth and said, drag along these magicians and deceivers that have deceived so many souls of women by saying we are worshipers of God. And he caused throngs to be brought and bound their feet. And he ordered and he ordered to bring clubs and strong cords. And after boring holes through Philip's ankles, they brought hooks and put the cords through his ankles and hung him head downwards on a tree that was before the, to- the door of the pagan temple. And they fixed pegs into the temple wall and left him. And after binding Bartholomew hand and foot, they extended him naked on the wall. And when they had stripped Miriam, the appearance of her body was changed and became like glass, like a glass chest filled with light. And they could not even come near her. And the Savior, having appeared at that hour, said to Philip, Philip, behold, my bridal chamber is ready. And blessed is he who is who has his own shining garment for he it is who gets the crown of joy upon his head. Behold, the supper is ready, and blessed is he who is called by the bridegroom. Great is the harvest of the field. Blessed is the able workman. Aren't those the words that you want to hear? (laughs) The apostle Philip, hanging head down, said, Men of the city, hear these words which I am going to say to you. Hanging head down, you have learned how great are the powers of God and the wonders which you have seen. And after thus speaking, Philip prayed, saying, My Lord Jesus Christ, Father of the ages, King of all light, who makes us wise in your wisdom, who has given us the exalted knowledge, who has graciously conferred upon us the counsel of your goodness, who has never departed from us. Come, Lord, and give me the crown of victory in the presence of men. Let not their dark air develop, envelop me, nor their smoke burn the shape of my soul, that I may cross the waters of the abyss and not sink in them. May the Lord Jesus Christ let not the enemy find anything that he can bring against me in the presence of you, the true judge, but clothe me in your shining robe. The story goes on that at this moment, there was a massive earthquake in Hierapolis. The ground opened before the apostles and the men who had crucified them sank down into the abyss and died. The ground then closed up and covered them over. Those who had converted to Christianity at the hands of the apostles came to take them down. Bartholomew, the story says, was crucified much higher on the wall and they could not get to him as quickly. I'm sorry, Philip was crucified higher on the wall. When they did finally take Philip down, he was already dead. But Bartholomew was barely alive and they nursed him back to health. I have a quotation here that Bernard Ruffin, who I showed you his book earlier, says that Philip died at the age of 87. Bartholomew, again, mentioned in the Synoptic Gospels in those lists which I showed you, but Bartholomew is nowhere mentioned in the Gospel of John. Very interesting that we hear the story of Nathaniel in the Gospel of John, but nowhere is Nathaniel mentioned in the Synoptic Gospels. This led to the conclusion that Bartholomew and Nathaniel must be the same person. However, be aware that this is quite late, okay? It was a ninth century man, uh, Elias of, D- of Damascus, unknown to most people, unknown to myself before I looked him up, Elias of Damascus in the ninth century who made this connection. But it sunk with most people, and most people accepted it because it makes sense that Bartholomew, Bartholomew, if you know the Hebrew, is actually not his, his first name, okay, but his father's name. And so he became known as Nathaniel. Nathaniel Bartholomew. 
There is an ancient text called the Apostolic Acts of Abdias. Abdias was, by tradition, the Bishop of Babylon, and he was believed to have been consecrated by St. Simon the Apostle, and that he personally knew the Apostles. In this text, it says that Bartholomew was a man of medium height. He was very fair complexion. He had black curly hair, and it contrasted with his big gray beard. His face was dominated by a long, straight nose, and he had a powerful voice. Both Eusebius and St. Jerome tell us that Bartholomew, after leaving Hierapolis, after establishing the church there after his buddy Philip had been martyred, he confirmed the church there, he ordained a bishop there, and then he left and made his way from Hierapolis into Asia and finally into India where he took a copy of the Gospel of Matthew written in Hebrew, discovered 150 years later by a man who came out of there and went back to the ancient city, I believe it was yeah, Alexandria, taking that Gospel with him. The people there in the town believed, in India, believed and knew that the Apostle Bartholomew had visited them. According to those Acts of Abdias, the bishop of, that was ordained by Simon, that from India, Bartholomew traveled throughout Persia, where he healed the daughter of King Ptolemaeus from demonic possession and baptized both the girl and the king into the faith. The king's brother, who must have been more powerful than the king himself, as you know, in some of these things, you almost have puppet kings. The king's brother, hearing of the conversion of his, his brother, the king, became enraged and enticed by some local pagan priests, seized the holy apostle in the city of Albanus. He crucified Bartholomew head down. And while hanging on the cross, St. Bartholomew continued to preach about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The brother of the king refused to listen. He ordered him to be flayed alive. The apostle did not die and continued to preach the resurrection of Christ. When the brother of the king saw him still alive, he had him beaten with clubs, skinned alive, and finally beheaded. St. Bartholomew, pray to God for us. Are these stories interesting to you guys? I hope so. I hope they're giving you some sense that these are real people that did real things. They took that message of Jesus Christ so seriously that they were willing to leave their homes, go to lands which they had never seen. They were willing to be crucified. Bartholomew was crucified twice. He's a double martyr. And he never stopped. Imagine if we in, the, in our church were willing to go like that for Christ, even to our neighbors, into the grocery stores, to the people who we know, that we would live our life as apostles for Christ. I'll cover in very quickly James the Lesser. And I say very quickly because we know virtually nothing about James the Lesser. We do know that he was the son of Alphaeus. In each of the synoptic gospels, he is listed as such. James, the son of Alphaeus. Alphaeus, from the Hebrew, Halphi or Kalphi, is the same name translated as Cleopas or Clopas. Alphaeus and Clopas or Cleopas are the same guy. Do you guys remember where you hear the name Clopas from? Where? What's that? Yeah, he was, okay, he was the husband of one of the women at the crucifixion. Where else? What's that? Yeah, on the road to Emmaus. He was one of the disciples of the Lord. Okay? And he was the father of two of the apostles. You want to know some holy men to pray to? St. Alphaeus or Zebedee. Sons don't become saints and apostles without fathers who are already saints and disciples. These were great men that raised great children who God came and chose to convert the world. 
Hegesippus, a second century church historian, identified Cleopas as Joseph's brother. Joseph's brother. Now, this is very interesting because in the Gospels, at the crucifixion, it is said that Mary, the Theotokos, Mary's sister, Mary, or Miriam, was the wife of Cleopas. So now we have relations back to Christ on two sides. And if that gets confusing to you as family relations, that's what they do in the Middle East. Okay, first cousins marry first cousins in the Middle East. As I said, we know virtually nothing about James the Lesser unless you want to associate him with James the Righteous of Jerusalem, uh, the Bishop of Jerusalem, which we know quite a bit more about, who was martyred by throwing off the pinnacle of the temple. It is generally held that James the Less stayed in Jerusalem with his cousin, James the Just. And then after staying in Jerusalem for a while, he traveled to Egypt, while well, other traditions say that he traveled as far into Ethiopia, where he was also martyred by crucifixion. I will leave you with this thought. Keep in mind, as we are reading these apostles, keep in mind the last words that our Lord spoke to the apostles in the Gospel of Matthew. Go out into all nations, teaching them all everything I have taught you. These men had those words ringing in their ears. They couldn't get those words out of their heart. And it drove them to the farthest lands. I ask you, during this time of Lent, make these 12 apostles your guides in what it means to be a Christian. What it means to be a Christian and whether we're living that apostolic life today. And if we don't live that apostolic life, what does it mean for the rest of the world? God bless you. Thank you for listening. Uh, all right. Question and answer. You were drawing from several sources when you were giving us this tradition and the stories about the apostles. Yeah. Are those traditions compiled into any one volume? Right. That that's we can a consult? that's a very good question. Uh, unfortunately, uh, not well. Uh, they're not put together. And I'll tell you why. Is the problem of modernism? Can we trust anything that we can't test? Who is King Abgarus? Is it possible for someone to actually heal somebody else? No, of course, that's nonsense. Nobody can heal somebody else. So therefore, the text isn't to be trusted. Of course, the entire gospel's out then, right? Um, so, uh, w so unfortunately, many of these texts come to us in various pieces. Many have not been translated, or if they're translated, they're, okay, a quotation is given. Uh, that's why you get a lot of from Eusebius, because Eusebius and stuff has been translated. Um, and, and they're in various places. The best source I have found, and I'm not saying it's a great source, um, but the best source I have found is this nice little book called The Lives of the Holy Apostles. It's put out by the Russian Orthodox. Um, and uh, it's, you, in fact, if you just Google the Lives of the Holy Apostles, um, Orthodox, you'll come up with it. Okay, you say, why would I read something from the Orthodox? These are our brothers and sisters up in Russia. Okay, number one. Number two is modernism hasn't infected the church and the people there quite as badly, at least the Christians. Okay, so you have texts which have come down to us. This, this book is a compilation of those most ancient stories that I am reading to you. However, a lot of times, just for sake of, of brevity, they will edit it down. In fact, it's been edited, I think, about four times officially since the early early church. And I, they, I traced the uh, the references back. And so you can go back. It was the, These texts were edited at the turn of the first millennium significantly by one of the saints, okay, and so forth. And so it comes, the story comes through these saints and finally down to this book. 
Um, but it goes back, if you go back to the original text of the ones that have been translated, like the Acts of Philip, they're coming right through. That's the stories that are given in this book, but they're just in a more maybe a truncated form, which is nice for us because it's very readable. The only thing I don't like about this book is it doesn't footnote itself well. In fact, horribly, horribly. And so for someone like myself, I'm like, okay, well, where'd you get that one from? Um, I had to go back then to the original sources and find it to know what story they're using to tell the story. And once I knew that story, then I could use the text that they had edited down for our sake in some of these cases, which made it much easier for us to read in here rather than a 30 page Gnostic text, which half of it is, is, is very, very fanciful. Okay. So does that help? Is that helpful? That's what I would recommend. Okay. There's a question coming in online from Marie. It says, why does it matter whether or not St. Joseph had sons? How does that increase our faith? I have read that as a young man, he, uh, like Our Lady, took a vow of chastity yeah. and died in the arms of Jesus. Christ. Sure. Well, it, look, you could throw all of this stuff out and say, well, why read anything about the saints? We've got the pure gospel text. Go back to my talk last week. The early church, and I hope we in this room have the same feeling, that when you touch the lives of those who touched the life of God, you see God himself. As St. Paul says, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. I read you from St. Paul's instruction to Timothy, right? Saying, or not to Timothy, talking about Timothy, right? Say, listen to what he says. Why? Because he knows very well that St. Timothy is going to say exactly what his master said. Because St. Paul is going to say exactly what his master said. We want to know the lives of the apostles. We want to know the lives of the saints. And I shared with you that beautiful quotation from St. John Chrysostom. And I think this hits at the heart of the matter. What does it matter? St. Joseph had sons or he, he was a young man. He was an old man. First of all, the fact is that the most ancient tradition, ancient tradition is that he was an older man. Okay. St. John Chrysostom says this, I wish that it were possible to meet with one who could deliver to us the history of the apostles. Not only all they wrote and spoke of, but also the rest of their daily life, even what they ate, when they walked and where they sat, what they did, and so forth, where they lodged. I want to know everything about them, because if I get to know them, I'm going to get to know Christ. And it's so fundamentally important for us when we're studying these texts. These aren't just stories, and they're not just people that lived a long time ago. These are the ones that show us how to live the life of, of Christianity. Okay, why do I want to know about Joseph? Because I want to know about Joseph. Joseph was my father. I want to know him. Don't you want to know the story of your grandfather? Of course you do. Because you want to know who you are. It matters. It matters. So I think enough said about that. These are beautiful stories that, that uh, the modern world doesn't, doesn't care about. But it makes all the difference in the world to us to know who our family members are. Okay. Do we have any writings or references that would say why God allowed so many of his early apostles to be martyred, treated so horribly, die such horrible deaths? Uh, the only thing I can say is that these were men that wanted to be like Christ. And so many of them, we've heard the story of St. Polycarp, St. Uh, you know who reminds St. Ignatius? Remember when St. Ignatius is making his way to Rome? You can hear about this. We have a talk on it. And he says, he writes ahead to the, the, to the, to the people, to the Christians in Rome. He says, please, for the love of God, if you care anything for me, don't stop them from what they're going to do. And he knew very well he's going to be fed to the lions. Okay. Please don't stop them. I want to be ground up and made bread for God. To be in the teeth of the lions. Okay. I want to be made bread for God. Is that beautiful? They wanted to be like their master. And why did God allow them to undergo this? For our sake. These are witnesses, martyrs of what it means to be a Christian. It's not good enough for us to go to church on Sunday. It's not good enough to say, I'm a Christian. To be a Christian is to be a martyr. I talked about this last week to say my former life is no more. That's what Lent's all about. Enough with that. I have a new life. It's the life Christ has given me. And now everything I'm going to do is based upon that, no matter what comes. Death. 
No, no matter what comes, and they want to crucify me, it doesn't matter. But look at what happened to these guys. They died full of joy. And I'll, I'll go just one step further, and, and, and I hope I don't upset anybody in this room, but next week we're going we're gonna to look at the, at the story of the, the uh, martyrdom of St. Matthew when they tried to burn him to death. Okay, and why did they want to burn him to death? So that nothing would be left of his holy remains. So that his disciples couldn't come and collect those bones which we have here with us. So that they couldn't be venerated anymore. And it's very sad today, very sad, when we as, as Christians burn the bodies of the saints those who die among us. I was just at a funeral today and there were the, the ashes of the person. The church didn't allow that to take place for, for many, many years because that was one of the things that the godless heathens did to us. They burned our bodies so that there would not be any remains left on this earth to be reverenced. God made our bodies and we are to offer those bodies to him in sacrifice and to treat them with the greatest respect, the greatest respect. It's a little bit off of your question, but I had to say it. I know the church allows for cremation. I know it does, but it doesn't mean we have to do it. It makes the allowance today. It's an allowance. Well, the church allows for a lot of things today. It doesn't mean that that's what we have to do. So I think it's good to follow the traditions of our fathers and honor the bodies of those that have gone before us. Uh, yeah, about 15 years ago, I read in the book saying uh, in Hebrew language, they don't have the word cousin. So that's why they call yeah. Paul James sure. whatsoever. I'll just, let me say it so that people can understand, those watching online, that in the Hebrew language, the word for brother or cousin is the same. And it's true because... It, over the, in the Middle East, first cousins marry first cousins. It just happens, okay? So there's this, the family is very tightly connected. Um, and so certainly, it was St. Jerome who first pointed that out, by the way. It was St. Jerome who talked about Simon and Jude as also sons of Alphaeus and brothers of James the Less and, and, and Matthew Levi, so that he, that he conflated James the Less with James the Righteous. Jerome was the first one to do that. And he did it explicitly stating that he believed they were all sons of Alphaeus because of Mary's virginity. And to protect Mary's virginity, Joseph would be one who was fully chaste, fully chaste. Okay. Fine for St. Jerome. And some people do hold that. But the vast majority of the fathers disagree with him. The vast majority of the fathers, and I read you tonight from Eusebius and others, who talk about Joseph as having sons. But I'm glad we're fin we'll finish with it tonight. Remember, friends, marriage is upheld by the church as something beautiful, never as something dirty. Marriage is wonderful and beautiful. Celibacy in the church is also wonderful and beautiful. But let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. In order to protect the Virgin Mary, we have to show that Joseph was never married because if he was married, he was then dirty and then could not be next to the pure virgin. I'm sorry, that's a bad way to do theology. Okay? Marriage is sacred and beautiful and is never in conflict with the other sacraments of the church. And this is why the church does ordain married men to the priesthood. And this is why Jesus also chose married men as his apostles, because marriage is not dirty. It's beautiful. It is a gift from God. Does that mean that there's something wrong with the celibacy? Not at all. It is wonderful and beautiful and is also a gift from God. <laughs> We had Father Sly teaching on Sunday for us, didn't he? I'm a married deacon. In the Eastern churches, it's possible for me to be ordained a, a priest. It's possible. And if God calls me to that, then it would be a wonderful gift. And maybe my wife would agree and then we could do that. We'll see. Maybe someday. I don't know. It's a gift from God. So we don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater and say, well, we can't accept Joseph. 
because of what we believe about Mary. Not at all. Not at all. And I say say the most ancient tradition is that Joseph was married prior to him being betrothed to the mother of God as an older man then to protect her. And this would make a lot of sense out of the text of the gospel that call James and Simon and Jude and Joses the brothers of the Lord. Okay. We also hear about the brothers of the Lord throughout the gospel coming and struggling with his identity. One of the things I'm so thankful for in this series for myself is to see these family connections and these friendships. These were real guys. And I can't wait. I'm going back to the Holy Land in May. I can't wait to go to Bethsaida and to, 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 uh, to Capernaum and to see these places again. And remember, these are the guys that walked there. They washed their clothes there. They lived with our Lord. You know, the Archbishop Shakur says beautifully in his book, Blood Brothers, he says, Jesus, as a boy, Jesus was my hero. He was my hero. And I think people of the Middle East really get that sense. He's a real person. He's their hero. He's the one they want to follow. He's their best friend. God bless you. I'll see you next week. We hope you enjoyed this presentation from the Institute of Catholic Culture. If you'd like to learn more about the mission of the Institute and how you may become a part of this important work, please visit our website at www.instituteofcatholicculture.org or call us at 540-635-7155. And may the glory of Christ Church be ever more manifest upon the earth. St. John the Evangelist. Pray for us.